your life. You just put it in there for a moment while I'll grab it. Okay. Can you do we hear? Do we hear? Okay. It's a great pleasure to be speaking to my fellow shellbacks. It's been a few years since I took the podium here. And it's been even longer since I started this project. It's taken me 40 years. Okay. I had hair when I started. Um, it's also a great privilege to be talking about this here at Royal Canadian Yacht Club simply because one of the major influences as I was growing up was a guy named C.H.J. Snyder. Now, some of you who are old enough will remember Jerry Snyder as the club historian and, and the author of some pretty remarkable books. And growing up in Sarnia, um, yeah, we had the, the usual yo-ho-ho, -ho, life before the mass books. However, we had several well-thumbed copies of Jerry Snyder's books. Among them, the story of the Nancy and other 1812ers and the story of the Shannon. Uh, and I spent a lot of time reading those books and I was fascinated with it because I didn't need to dream about other seas. I had Lake Huron right there and it was a big sea. It still is. And uh, so that was, that was my sea tale. And uh, now, Weather Bomb 1913, let me just change the slide here. Oop. Weather Bomb 1913, Life and Death of the Great Lakes, is one of those stories that comes together over time. Uh, in historical writing, if it doesn't involve a politician or war, there isn't a great deal of ready documentation. So I began from scratch researching uh, what went on on the night of November 9, 1913 by combing through newspaper and provincial archives, visiting the shipwrecks themselves, uh, and uh, canvassing the people who lived along the lakes for living memories of that day. Surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, there were still some old folks who remembered the storm and its aftermath. Even more surprising is the interest that is still focused by weather scientists and merchant seamen on the conditions across the Great Lakes uh, Basin. Modern computer technology was necessary to put the weather information collected during the gale, which it turns out was surprisingly accurate, believe it or not, uh, into a much more understandable con uh, context. The actual writing part of the book went fairly smoothly, but I wanted Weather Bomb 1913 Life and Death in the Great Lakes to be something more than just an old farts book uh, to go beyond simply naming sh lost ships and recounting the most common tales swirling around the gale. I set out to create a narrative based on good writing and a holistic approach to storytelling as well as historical dis detective work. And I hope in some small way I've uh, succeeded. I'd like to begin with a short re... Just moved a whole bunch of pictures. Oh, did I? Oh, okay. Uh, boom, 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 boom. All right, okay. Uh, I'd like to begin with a short uh, reading from the book, and it takes on the loss of the, it's my take on the loss of the Charles S. Price. It's fictional because, as in most good historical writing, uh, that's fiction fleshing out facts, and uh, we didn't have anybody who survived the storm off of uh, 12 of the ships to really talk about what went on. Uh, it's fictional, uh, and I've told it from the perspective of Captain Edward McConkey, master of the SS Regina, and it's the only way the subse subsequent mystery makes sense to me. Okay, so if you'll bear with me for a minute.
Ahead of them in the murk and the waves, the captain could see at least two ships, maybe three. They were in line coming out of the river, so he couldn't be sure whether the second one was hiding another boat. The ship closest to him appeared to be having a bad time. Looks like she's shipping water, Wes had seen the problem as well. Maybe the hatch covers are starting to come loose. The oncoming vessel was down a little bit by the head. Let's see if we can get closer in case he needs help, McConkie, tur McConkie said, turning the wheel five degrees to port. This brought the ship to a slight angle with the waves and reduced the problem with the stern, but it caused the ship to roll and made it slightly more difficult to steer. In these seas, he didn't know if he could help the men on the other ship, if something did go wrong, but at least the Regina would be in a position to try to help. The ship in the distance was faring badly. She had taken on a starboard list as well. As the Regina closed on her, the men in the wheelhouse were horrified to see a wave sweep across the ship's rail and lift two of the forward hatch covers off. The canvas battens, the canvas battens and planking that made up the covers washed over the side in a jumble, and two great black mouths yawned in the deck to swallow each and every ensuing wave. Let's see if we can work our way across her port bow. Maybe we can block the waves enough that the crew, the crew can get on deck and cover those holds with temporary covers. Not only McConkie, but the rest of the men in the pilot house knew that this was really a hope against hope. As the Regina closed on the ship, McConkie waited for the captain of the other boat to set both his bow anchors, but they remained firmly lodged in the hawse pipes. The other boat had ceased making way, uh, and at the moment he was still above, uh, had ceased making way. At the moment, uh, the Regina was still above the endangered boat, but McConkie couldn't get too close or the waves would wash him right on top of it. For the moment, the wind was acting as his friend, pushing the canaler across the other ship's bow. With a slight course correction, the Regina could slowly be steered in front of the stricken ship's port bow, creating a wind and wave screen. If the other crew was fast, they could get boards and tarps over the two holes, making emergency hatch covers. Then the pumps might stand a chance of catching up. McConkie told Shade to take the wheel and yelled for a deckhand. Go aft and find Bert, get him to organize some other guys, tell him to get dressed in warm clothes and oilers. We're going to come as close to the ship over there as possible. After McConkie told the deckhand what he wanted, he turned back to Shade and started to explain what he needed his wheelsman to do. One of the deckhands had returned from the stern castle, climbed the stair to the wheelhouse. There's another boat about a half a mile off our port side. They've lost two hatches and they're listing. I'm going to try to keep us between the storm and them so they can make repairs. Go aft and tell Bert I want four men ready to go if we have to start pulling their crew out of the water. Tell them to stay in the lee of the deck house. And after a moment, he said, and don't forget to put on their life belts and tie themselves onto the ship. I don't want to lose anyone. Then almost as an afterthought, I'll use the signal. I'll use the whistle to signal what I want. Three blasts will mean do what the situation demands, and five means we, won't, we can't do anything, so get back in the deck house. <clears throat> he hated to send anyone out on deck, but if that ship foundered, they wouldn't have much time to get her crew off. With Bert and the others ready for action, they would at least save a few precious section, seconds. The uh, Regina was making some leeway. To counteract this, Shea took it upon himself to head the vessel a little higher into the weather. McConkie acknowledged the tactic, thanking the wheelman, wheelsman. He still waited for the other skipper to drop his hooks. Maybe he thinks he can power through. Wes was thinking the same thoughts as McConkie. Getting the anchors down and holding on the bottom was the prudent thing at this point. If he does, he doesn't realize how much trouble his boat's in. McConkie knew dozens of skippers who believed their ships were invincible. Until today, he didn't think the Great Lakes could get bad enough to hurt a modern steel vessel if it was properly handled. Now he wasn't so sure. Then he saw the other boat's stern and watched helplessly as it prop spun wildly out of the water. Snow shrieked down on them and the other ship disappeared for a few seconds. When he saw it again, the ship was closer and its list has increased. Her yawing through the waves was, almost, was, all, was also more pronounced. 
The while corkscrewing by the Regina as the waves tossed her through a full 25 degrees was making holding her course all but impossible. McConkie told Che to add Nate more to starboard, bringing her beam harder against the storm. The correction increased the ship's movement until McConkie decided it was too dangerous to try to continue and told Che to fall off the wind until the boat settled in. He trusted Jane and left the amount of correction to his discretion. Leaving Wes and Shea to look after the ship, McConkie and Nobby Roberts stepped out on the protected side of the wing bridge. Both were wearing full oil skins and sou'westers. The protection offered by the bulk of the wheelhouse was minimal, but the waves were still assaulting, assaulting the after end of the boat, and as long as they pressed their backs against the side of the wheelhouse, they were safe. The wind caught Nobby's hat and ripped it off, spinning it out into the lake. It didn't sink. A moving skin of ice and snow covered the raging seas, except at the very top of the breaking waves. From inside the wheelhouse, the captain hadn't noticed it, but from the wing bridge, he saw it plainly, and it stretched as far as the eye could see. The field rose and fell with the waves. <clears throat> at other times, when he'd taken the ship through fields of ice, there was a sound like crystal tinkling around the hull. Now any sound except that of the wind was washed away. Suddenly a distress rocket went up from the wheelhouse of the other boat, the, uh, then another. The old man of the vessel was signaling that they were in mortal danger. He still hadn't let his hooks go. Maybe they're jammed. The front of the boat was covered in ice almost to a third of the ship's entire length. It was possible water penetrating the capstan flat had rendered the machinery useless. The rockets were still burning when the port door of the aft deck house on the other boat sprang open and men rushed out onto the deck. Impotent, McConkie and Roberts watched as more than a dozen men leapt onto the main deck and began skidding and sliding. They were dressed in shirt sleeves and work pants. None of them was prepared for the weather. Half were wearing light belts. Two men fell and slid across the desk. One grabbed the base of the winch and hung on. The other bounced across the scuppers and shot over the edge of the boat between the deck and the fence. Slowly the boat roll, started to roll. A wave slammed against the waist. And, and flooded back toward the stern. Most of it plunged into the two open holes. The ship rolled even more with the port rail rising higher. The men on the deck clung to it and started to climb over its fence. In the lee of the Regina's aft deck house, Bert and the other men were collecting life belts around their feet in preparation uh, for the time when they would come within range to throw. The death sentence had been read and the other ship was standing on the scaffold with the noose around its neck. All that remained was for the weather to spring the trap. Men were trying to crawl out of the wheelhouse on the port side. They were too high above the water, and the ship had twisted even more. Now if they jumped, they'd land on the main deck or bounce off the hull instead of making it into the water. McConkie could make out the ship's name, the Charles S. Price. The cargo must be shipped, he Nobby yelled to, into McConkie's ear. In response, he just nodded his head, but did not take his eyes off the dying boat. The prop was completely out of the water now and spinning wildly. The men on the rail began jumping into the lake. McCaukey's heart was beating so hard, the terror of it all, that his ribs were quaking. In the water, the men were screaming for help. McConkie listened, but couldn't hear them. The storm carried their pleas downwind and away from the ship and his ears. Some of the men raised their hands in supplication. Others tried to swim through the ice. Nothing worked, and the movement slowed, then stopped altogether. McConkie threw himself back into the wheelhouse and shouted for Shale to bring them closer to the other ship. He had seen his crew getting ready to throw the life belts and wanted to give them the best chance of reaching the men in the water. When the captain came out of the wheelhouse to see if his crew could hurl the life belts far enough to do any good, he was astounded to witness two crewmen turning out the port lifeboat to have it. He began to wave at them at he began to wave at them to stop. A small boat wouldn't survive in these seas, and no number of men could row against them anyway. Then he saw Bert trying a long line to the mooring bit, and he understood what they were going to do. They would lower the boat with two men in it, then stream it back in the hope that they could pick up some of the survivors in the water. Check her back until we just have a little way on and bring her closer to that ship. We're too far to throw life belts to the McConkie yelled through the pilot house door to Adams. 
If he couldn't stop the men from their attempt, then he could at least help them by keeping the ship as close to the his ship as close to the other ship as possible. Shea edged the Regina closer to the doomed boat, but he had to be careful not to get too close because the danger of sucking the swimmers into the ship's propellers. He also, they also needed enough distance to compensate for the leeway the ship was developing because of her position across the wind. It would be fatal to drift down on the other ship, not just to the men in the water who would be crushed, but for the Regina herself with her top-heavy deck load of iron sewer pipe. One shove could shift the entire deck cargo completely, causing her to capsize as well. When McConkey turned around again, he watched the dying ship start to roll faster and faster onto its starboard side. The men who could jumped into the water and screamed against the wind for help. From the number who first made it off the price, it was apparent that there were still many trapped inside. But as the list worsened, they flooded onto the deck and climbed over the fence, leaping into the lake. Then the ship completely turned turtle and squatted with her keel upright in the storm. Her propeller was spinning madly, and her hull glistened as water ran off of it. Above the gale, a loud groaning could be heard, and there were a series of explosive bangs, and the ship bobbed up at least six feet higher than she was when she first went over. McConkie knew right away she'd lost her cargo. Whatever it was broke through the hatches, lightening the hull, and poured onto the bottom. In the water, many of the people who got off the ship were already floating face down. The ones without life belts started to drift beneath the ice to the bottom. In some cases, the ice buoyed them up, although they were past carrying. The crew hiding in the lee of the aft deckhouse started throwing life belts to the dying men. They were close enough now that a great heave would get the emergency floats close to some of them uh, who were still conscious and aware uh, and who could tie them on. One of the Regina's boats was swung out and six men were lowered into the water. It rose and fell and slammed against the hull. Burton and another man threw a second line over the rail, this time to the men in the boat. McConkie watched Bert yell instructions down. One man started to tie the line around his waist. Before he finished, a wave came streaming down the hull of the Regina, pitching the freighter's stern high in the air and then smashing it down, almost onto the lifeboat and its occupants. The boat disappeared for a moment, then swung back into sight. Two of the crewmen were tossed from the boat and floated in the waters from, with the others from the stricken vessel and clung to whoever was closest and they could wrap their arms around. The four men in the lifeboat began hauling men into their craft, but it was impossible for the Regina to pick her men up. They were already dead. They just needed to die. It was useless to make any further attempts. The lifeboat swung close to the Regina's counter, but her crew had the presence of mind to cut themselves loose from the bigger ship before their fragile wooden boat smashed into bits. They would face the storm in their open boat and pray to make it to shore and shelter. McConkie's ship was too close to the overturned hull to be safe. A few more minutes drifting in the direction they were sliding, then they would collide. The captain of the Regina had no option. He ordered Adams to signal full ahead and Shade to turn the wheel to starboard until they were well clear of the danger. So, uh, in a few minutes, I'll tell you about the mystery that followed up uh, the storm. But f uh, uh, right now, uh, I'd like to continue on with the slide presentation. Uh, so now, you know, let's put some faces to the tale. First, we need to look at the ships that were lost and those that survived in total. There are 12 long ships that went down on the lakes. Uh, these, these were lost on Superior, Huron, Michigan, and Erie. Uh, Lake Ontario was fortunate enough to be on the weaker edge of the cyclone, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and did not suffer as much, although a number of boats were slightly damaged here on Lake Ontario. On Superior, the Algoma steamer Leafield was lost with all hands, as was the Henry B. Smith. Mm -hmm. Lake Michigan, with uh, some of the worst seas in the storm, suffered only one sinking, the schooner barge Plymouth. And there will be more on her in a few minutes. Lake Erie lost only one ship as well. That was the uh, light ship, U.S. light ship number 82. Uh, let's 
most of the destruction on Europe, Euron, um, uh, Euron was the serial killer in this tale. Uh, she sent eight ships to the bottom with her crew. The Regina, the Wexford, the Charles S. Price, the James C. Carruthers, the Isaac M. Scott, John A. McGeehan, Hydrus, and Argus. These were among the biggest, and in the case of the Carruthers, the newest on the lakes. Most of the destruction on uh, Euron uh, occurred uh, uh, along the Michigan shore, and it's assumed that those ships, still missing, went down somewhere off of Saginaw Bay. To date, we've only found four of the wrecks uh, in the, from the storm, uh, so that it still leaves another eight missing on uh, uh, on all the lakes. Um, they found the um, Smith on Lake Superior. They found the uh, the Regina, the uh, um, uh, Wexford, and the um, uh, Argus uh, or the Hydrus. I'm sorry, uh, on Lake Huron. Uh, now the U.S. Lightship. 82 was recovered and salvaged uh, within uh, two years of the storm. Um, so there's still, there's still a lot of unanswered questions out there with the wrecks. Most of those missing probably went down off of Saginaw Bay. It makes sense because there was another ship reported capsized at the mouth of the bay immediately after the storm. And many folks believe that that might have been the Carruthers. They weren't the only... Uh, they weren't the only victims. Uh, there are just a few of those whose crews dis disappeared completely from the face of the earth. In the total, there were more than 30 lake boats driven ashore, where, as in the case of the Louisiana, burnt completely to the waterline. There were 256 people on the ships who were lost, but more were lost ashore and then uh, um, various accidents caused by the storm. So my best guess right now is that it's close to 300 people were killed in this storm. And uh, it's generally considered to be the worst disaster in Central North America, weather-related, um, in history. Now, uh, on uh, Lake Erie, boats like the C.W. Elphick are already in trouble when uh, she was victimized by the blow. The Elphick had run aground on Long Point several weeks before, and salvagers hadn't recovered her or her cargo of flax when the big storm struck. And so she was washed off the uh, shallows where she had been grounded and just completely destroyed. Others like the Scottish hero, hero and Acadian ran aground in Superior and were, were refloated only to be sunk by German guns and torpedoes a few years later during the, sec the First World War. But what about the ships that the lost ships themselves. We do know that they were relatively new for the most part, averaging just a little more than eight years old. Um, one headline said these were the strongest ships built in the Empire. Um, in the life of a ship, that's a very short time, eight years. The Carruthers was launched in the late spring of 1913. So she was less than six months old. The Plymouth was the oldest boat, and she was a dowdy old cut-down lumber schooner, uh, and the only wooden boat lost in the storm. All except the Plymouth were steel ships held together by rivets. Welded ships were still uh, nearly a decade away. Most, for and at, most were fore and afters, ships with the wheelhouse up front, uh, and the engine room back aft, but the Leafield and Wexford were constructed with the wheelhouse and engine room in the center of the boat. There, this is more uh, an ocean-going and coastal construction. Light, sh light ship 82, uh, light ship 82 was purpose-built 
to endure the harshest uh, conditions while on station. She was the only whaleback designed to be lost. And if you have a look, uh, you can see the decks are rounded. Now, this was kind of a, this design came into being because uh, whale, uh, the uh, ships were created first to cheat the tolls on the Suez Canal. Uh, which charged by the square foot of main deck space. So being rounded at the hull, a hull deck joint, meant a smaller deck footprint without reducing the cargo carrying capacity. So they didn't have to pay as much to go through the Suez Canal. Uh, still, several survivors of the storm attributed their survival to the whale back design. They thought it was pretty good. Uh, although that's never actually been proven, and uh, the whaleback uh, eventually fell out of favor as a commercial design. Okay, now we're just about to finish the technical info on the ships, but it's important to know that, uh, so that you have an understanding of what happened. Probably the biggest differences between 1913 vintage ships and the commercial vessels you see passing on the seaway today are the sheer size of the boats. Their engines, horsepower, and the types of propellers, and the cargo carrying capacities. Today, ships are a minimum of 30% larger than in 1913. The Carruthers was the longest uh, uh, ship lost in the storm, and it was largest in the British Empire at 550 feet. Uh, boats like the Leefield, the Regina, and Wexford were short. They were around 250 feet long, and uh, they were designed to fit through the earlier locks of the Welland Canal. And so, you know, they, they took on the, the uh, name Canalers because, of this, because they were specifically built to fit the Welland Canal. Uh, being smaller, they also had less powerful engines. Um, the, uh, uh, the Regina had a three-cylinder triple expansion steam engine developing scant 650 horsepower uh, to drive the ship along in an average of six knots. Okay. The, uh, it's not, it's not uh, you know, they're not uh, talking uh, light speed here. And the interesting thing is, just to put this into context, some of today's 38-foot offshore racing boats, uh, you'll see them on the waterfront down here, you'll see them on, you know, throughout the uh, Great Lakes Basin and down in Florida. Uh, they have more than a thousand horsepower to drive them along. Okay, so, yeah, there's quite a difference. A ship like the Algoma Spirit, uh, which I've, I've made a couple of passages on, and it's not the newest in the current Algoma fleet, but certainly not the oldest, produces 11,000 horsepower to drive the ship. Uh, for a ship 230 feet longer than the Carruthers, the Spirit has nearly 11 times the horsepower. So modern ships are big, powerful brutes. Uh, they can power through a lot. Uh, today's ships also have variable pitch propellers, props on which the angle of the blades can be changed to match the sea condition. In 1913, propellers were, were fixed and could not have the angle changed without going into dry dock, meaning that in certain conditions they did not achieve as an efficient a bite in the water. And modern ships are also fitted out today with a tube or a quart nozzle over the uh, propeller uh, to direct the thrust and give it, uh, make better use, more efficient use of the thrust of the propeller. Um, all of this is to carry huge loads of grain. Now, we get all romantic about reading canvas and rope stories by Connor Cruz O'Brien and all those guys, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of people in this room don't realize that the annual grain run from Duluth and Thunder Bay 
down to the lower lakes and then to the lower St. Lawrence, make the great grain races look like kids play. We ship more grain out of here in one season than Australia did in two, two decades. It is a major trade. Okay, the James Carruthers could haul 6,250 metric tons or 100 railroad cars of grain, of wheat. The most modern ships on the lakes, the Equinox class freighters that you're hearing about now and that are being built in China, can carry up to 300 grain cars worth of wheat with only a slight lengthening of the hull. So it almost goes without saying that the 1913 vintage boats may not have been as fully up to the task as they are today. Uh, and even today, captains are cautious about uh, taking their vessels out when the November witch pays a visit. Okay. This is the only photograph I've been able to find of a ship actually in the 1913 storm. That's the uh, James Murphy. Uh, and uh, we're not sure where it was taken. It might have been just uh, at the entrance uh, um, to the St. Mary's River system near Gross Cap, or other people have suggested it might be along the Michigan shore uh, uh, near Port Sanilac uh, to Harbor Beach. Nobody's sure. Uh, this is a, was a pretty rare photograph and um, it, uh, it was one of those uh, pieces of documentation that came as an answer to one of my prayers. Um, but just as a, as a little note, does anybody know where the term November Witch came from? November Witch. Okay. Uh, a lot of people attribute it to Gordy Lightfoot because he used it in the song Rack of the Ed Edmund Fitzgerald. But I recall hearing it as a kid, or you know, in, in lake ports like Sarnia and Godridge, even before the Edmund Fitzgerald went down, you know, we called that first two weeks of November and the storms that occurred the November Witch. And uh, I have a theory that it comes from Macbeth. Read the speech of the Weird Sisters and the opening pages of Macbeth, and, and you'll see why why I say that. Um, so most of what we know about conditions inside the storm come from uh, the survivors. There are credible stories of huge waves sle sweeping uh, here on an Erie. Let me just get the cat. Oh. Um, the captain of the steamer, Calcite, reported being overtaken by a giant wave on Lake Erie. Uh, it loomed up behind him taller than his, uh, higher than his uh, aft deck house. And it came down and it smashed the skylights on the top of the, on the, top of the deck house uh, and flooded out the, uh, the galley and the crew's quarters. Uh, interestingly, um, the uh, grandson of uh, Captain uh, Eiler just introduced himself at the boat show. And so the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the memories still live there. And there, there is the, support, the uh, report of a Captain Lyons who was skippering the J.H. Sheetal on Lake Huron. And he was overtaken by three huge waves. Okay, and again, it damaged and almost crashed down through, they did crash down through the uh, skylights over the engine room. The firemen and the engineers are working waist deep in water trying to keep the fires in the boiler going. Um, it washed all of the food out of the galley. <laughs> they had to go for 36 hours without even a cup of coffee. Uh, but um, it, it's interesting uh, that we have this record and uh, it may be that the Sheetal survived the killer waves uh, for a specific reason. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. But aside from the ships that were lost, there were, there were incredible tales of heroism. 
Um, the L.C. Waldo uh, ran a crown on Gold Rock near Michigan's uh, Kiwana Peninsula uh, in Lake Superior. Okay, let's get the. So we have the Kiwana Peninsula here, and it's a it's a finger of land that points out into Lake uh, Superior, and it is a bear. There are more than a hundred ships that have foundered on this particular piece of rock, and. Uh, uh, the uh, having sailed by it a number of times, I know a lot of skippers like to cut it close, but in bad weather, I don't think you really want to be doing that. Anyway, the uh, L.C. Waldo uh, lost its compass, lost its position, and you got to remember these guys had no electronic navigation. I mean, they didn't have radios. The, the ship owners all cried that they would go broke if they had to put radios on their ships. Uh, and so, you know, uh, in Canada anyway, the, uh, the government listened to the ship owners and uh, there were no two-way communications. All navigation was done line of sight and by dead reckoning. And we've all done re dead reckoning. And uh, picture that in whiteout conditions. Particularly if you've lost your taff log and uh, have no other way of telling where you're, you know how fast you're going and how far you've gone. Okay. So the L.C. Waldo, believing itself to be further north uh, on the lake, ran aground in Gull Rock, uh, which is. This little bit of land right at the end of uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula. And it stuck hard to ground there. But this was wilderness in the day. There, were, there, was, there were nobody living there. I mean, this was really wilderness. And uh, the uh, ship started to break up, and the captain, uh, Duddleson, uh, asked, you know, took all his passengers, and, uh, and those were the days when freighters did carry passengers, and his crew, plus the sole dog on the boat, up into the, up into the forepeak of the ship, to, uh, because it was the most stable on the ground. And they hunkered down and started to freeze to death. And the chief engineer is one of these, he's Rousseau's natural genius. He got two of his oilers, and they went and they ripped a bathtub out of one of the staterooms, hauled it into the, uh, hauled it onto the capstan flat, and uh, then uh, punched the bottoms out of a bunch of fire buckets and made a chimney, and they created an ad hoc stove, and they burned everything they could get their hands on just to stay warm, and. Uh, they, you know, they spent a, a rather uncomfortable couple of nights in this situation until uh, crews from the uh, from the U.S. Life Saving Station in the Kiwana Peninsula could get out to them and take them off the boat. Incidentally, those crews made three attempts to get them off the boat, and after the first two attempts. When they came back into harbor you know, unsuccessfully, the shore crews had to chip the ice off of them so they could get out of the boat. They were, they were literally frozen to the uh, thwarts in the boat. Uh, so it was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty terrible. Uh, another, Another ship, the Turret Chief, which is a whale back that went aground on Gull Rock, uh, was uh, a little more fortunate. The uh, skipper, realizing that his ship was uh, felt like it was breaking up, got everybody off the boat, and they built a lean-to of branches, scrub branches and brush and whatever they could get their hands on. Uh, and they moved into this, and they were there 96 hours before three Chippewa trappers rescued them and took them, took them uh, to safety. Uh, 
closer to Sarnia on Lake Huron, on the north side of Kettle Point. Uh, let me just get Kettle Point up here. Okay, you can see Kettle Point here. Uh, there's a little town called Port Franks there. Um, a ship called the Northern Queen ran aground. And uh, it was, uh, it had been fighting the, fighting the seas for, for uh, a day, excuse me, a day and a half uh, before it ran aground. Uh, and again, the skipper was worried that the uh, ship would break up on the bottom. Uh, that area there has a lot of boulders and, and what are ca called kettles. They're ge ge um, geological formations, big round rocks on the bottom and um, that can that can eviscerate a ship in, in a matter of minutes. Uh, so they uh, waited until things died down a little bit and floated, a, floated the ship's yawl ashore on a line and sent some of the crew ashore. And people from the area, fishermen from the area, this had been a big fishing area, uh, came out to, to the uh, shore and were willing to help but because of the rough seas, couldn't, couldn't really do a whole lot. So the first, uh, first load of uh, uh, Northern Queen's crew came ashore, and then the, the line to the uh, yawl boat from the ship parted. Oh, oh God, you know, it's, don't have any bad luck. You know, if you don't have bad luck, you don't have any luck at all. And uh, so after some... Uh, Hard thinking, they found a, found a crate of freight that would float, and they floated that ashore, and they managed to get the yawl boat back to the ship and successfully lightered all the crew off. Uh, on the last trip, uh, the ship turn, uh, the uh, yawl boat turned over, and the local fishermen, the, all, you know, the young guys, all jumped into the water and hauled the crew of the Northern Queen ashore. It was quite a, quite a brave thing to do because uh, uh, in a storm like that, the undertow is not very forgiving. Um, anyway, uh, several days after the storm, the Reed Wrecking Company of uh, Sarnia managed to get the uh, Northern Queen off the ground and towed it down to Sarnia where it was uh, patched up enough to get it to a dry dock. But another ship that was sighted off the same stretch of beach uh, was not so lucky. She may have been, and there's no cons confirmation of this, she may have been the SS Wexford, which was found uh, in 2000, sunk off of uh, St. Joseph's, on the, just north of Grand Bend, between Grand Bend and Godrich. And um, there's the old Wexford herself, and you can see she's, uh, she's really an ocean-going configuration. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Uh, Captain uh, Stevens of the Kamenaquistia had seen both the Northern Queen and the Wexford off of uh, Kettle Point during the storm. And although a lot of people in Godridge put, put stock in the story that the Wexford had been seen off of Godridge Harbor at the height of the gale, the facts just don't add up. Her present location, 11 kilometers uh, out from St. Joseph, indicates she was probably northbound trying to find uh, shelter Oh. oh, can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't realize I was just talking to myself. Uh, uh, anyway, she was, uh, she was found 11 kilometers out from St. Joseph's and south of uh, Goddard, uh, where it's believed she was probably he heading to try and get some shelter. Uh, those of you who haven't sailed on Lake Huron don't, probably don't know that between Sarnia and Tobermory, the only port of refuge really for a ship of any size is Godridge. Uh, if you can't get into Godridge, you're scuppered, and Godridge is a terrible place to try and get into. Um, so, it's my belief uh, that uh, she had beached at uh, Port Franks, and managed to extricate herself off of the off of the shoals, and uh, that that combined with the hard grounding earlier in the season, which was uh, might have been shoddily repaired. 
Okay, I don't want to point any fingers, uh, even a hundred years later, but it's uh, several ship captains told me they thought it might have been a bad patch job on the bottom of the Wexford. Uh, and the, uh, the grounding during the storm might have opened all that up again. And um, uh, Captain Bruce Cameron uh, was trying to make Godrich Harbor so he could get his crew off. Uh, and safe, and uh, he didn't quite make it. Um, it's interesting, I talked to an old guy, a man named Austin Schwamm, uh, around six years old at the time. Austin skipped school and went down to the uh, beach at St. Joseph to help recover bodies. Okay. Today we would be sending out trauma counselors. He just thought it was a grand adventure. And um, uh, he, even at 93, didn't feel any particular uh, ill effect. Okay, there are dozens of stories about survival and more than a few about ghostly farewell notes. Uh, from the storm. The most famous of these is the supposed message from Captain Hugh William of the Lightship 82, and it was scribbled on a board that drifted ashore near Point Abino in Lake Erie, as I was told, Point Abino, uh, and the press had a field day with it. Okay, the, uh, the message simply said, Goodbye, Nellie. Ship's breaking up fast. Williams. Okay. The problem is, is uh, first off, Nellie was not his wife's name. <laughs> and secondly, his wife said that's not his handwriting. But a certain reporter in the Buffalo uh, newspapers really pushed this story very, very hard. Uh, so, you know, you, you have to take all of this with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying, if you don't hear a good rumor by 9 o'clock in the morning, start one. Uh, obviously, this reporter did that. Anyway, William's wife name was Mary, and he never called her Nellie in her life, not on her Nellie. Another uh, message that was found on the beach uh, below Naftal's Point, uh, just south of Godridge, uh, read, I am with the boat, lashed to the wheels, dash B. And locals want to believe, and they still want to believe to this day, that this message was from Bruce Cameron, the captain of the Wexford. And uh, various versions are reported. One had it written in pencil, uh, while another had it hand-painted onto a life jacket and then thrown overboard. Okay, the third and final message was uh, from the Beyond the Watery Grave, was linked to U.S. Deputy Marshal Christopher Keenan, who was lost on the schooner barge Plymouth on Lake Michigan. Uh, all three messages have vanished. Nobody has them. We just have reports of them. <laughs> All right? Uh, but when you think about it, how likely is it these last words were actually written by the people they were supposed to have come from? I mean, you know, we talk about fake news today. <laughs> it's nothing new. Pat Rowe, the curator of uh, the Huron County Museum, and I have a long-term uh, friendship, and she has a healthy, healthy skeptical take on them. In uh, one day, in a telephone call, she just said to me, said, think about it. Think about it seriously. If you were fighting for your life on one of those ships, do you really think you'd take the time to paint a note on a life bell? Those men were having a hard time standing up during the storm, let alone wandering about the ship to find a life belt in the paint pot. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of funny. It, it is a very, you know, we, we, we learn a lot of social information from this storm. Uh, the storm itself was interesting in that it 
solved one murder and created another. In all in sound, the body of a fisherman washed up who was supposed to have drowned around the corner on Colpoise Bay, 30 miles away, against contrary currents that showed up in Owen Sound. And uh, when the uh, constabulary uh, found the fisherman's partner and uh, held his feet to the fire, so to speak, he finally confessed that he had bumped his partner off the boat to get, the, uh, to get sole ownership of the boat. The other interesting one uh, is the, the disappearance of Chris Keenan, the U.S. Deputy Marshal on the Plymouth. Uh, while I was researching the book, one of the uh, uh, museum curators over on Western Lake Michigan uh, passed my name along to the uh, U.S. Deputy, U.S. Marshal Service. And I got a call one day from uh, the historian down in Kansas. Now, Keenan disappeared without a trace while on duty. The trick was, was uh, the problem was, was that Keenan was escorting the Plymouth, which was supposedly under, well, was not supposedly, it was definitely under arrest, uh, but he was not supposed to be on the, uh, on the Plymouth. He was supposed to be on the boat towing the Plymouth. And interestingly, the captain of the uh, um, a boat towing the Plymouth, a guy named uh, Donald McKinnon, uh, was the guy who had been charged with failing to discard, uh, discharge his uh, cargo properly uh, and shorting his clients. And uh, he was the guy uh, who caused the uh, Plymouth to be arrested. So. There was a question, why was McKinnon on the boat that was arrested instead of on the tow boat? Well, nobody answered that very clearly at all. And then mysteriously, a couple of days after uh, the tow boat put into Menominee in Michigan, it sank.